Welcome to Women Entrepreneurship Week 2021 at Montclair State University. Our panel is Translating the Shift. I am the moderator. My name is Elizabeth Gearhart. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Gearhart Law, which is an IP firm. I'm also a co-host of a radio show on iHeart called Passage to Profit for Entrepreneurs. And I have my own startup, which is called Fireside Directory. But enough about me. I am very excited to be moderating a panel of accomplished entrepreneur professors. And the purpose of this panel is to bring attention to how academic research and researchers help to enact changes in entrepreneurship practice and policy to support women entrepreneurs. Our esteemed panel is comprised of Dr. Ethne Swartz, a professor of management at the Feliciano School of Business and coordinator of the entrepreneurship concentration in the Department of Management. She is also a Fulbright scholar and the founder of Carpe Art, an art marketing site for student creatives. She's also a research associate at the University of Pretoria's Gordon Institute of Business Science. We also have Dr. Heim Letwin, the Academic and Center Director of Entrepreneurship at Suffolk University in Massachusetts. He also holds the Carol Sawyer Parks Endowed Chair for Entrepreneurship. Dr. Diane Welsh is the Hayes Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship and Founding Director of the Entrepreneurship Programs at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. She is the recipient of three Lifetime Achievement Awards in Entrepreneurship and Family Business. Dr. Colette Henry is Head of Department of Business Studies at Dundalk Institute of Technology, Ireland, and Adjunct Professor at Griffith University, Australia. That's the map, right? <laughs> she is Editor of the International Journal of Gender and Entrepreneurship and Chair of the Global Women's Entrepreneurship Policy Research Network. Dr. Barry Bendell is an Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship at Suffolk University in Massachusetts. She's published several articles on gender and entrepreneurship with a focus on both innovation and online social networks. So for a little background, as part of our Women Entrepreneurship Week celebration, this discussion will center around the evolution of women's entrepreneurship over the past 20 years. Inspired by the Diana Project, this conversation aims to contextualize the changing framework of women's entrepreneurship by evaluating the progress that has been made in women's entrepreneurship over two decades, as well as the barriers that still exist. Our conversation will translate academic research and policy initiatives and link these to practice, demonstrating the important role that independent research plays in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So without further ado, I would love to get started with our panelists. Panelists, if you desire, please take a moment to introduce yourselves when you answer your first question and say a little bit more about who you are and what you do. We are gonna start with the money. <laughs> Entrepreneurs always need money. So my first question is for Ethne Sports. Ethne, when it comes to funding, is landscape improving for women to get angel or VC dollars? Are the attitudes of investors changing? Right, thanks Elizabeth. Um, I'll skip introducing myself. I think you did a brilliant job. So very briefly, I think for our audience, particularly if they come from non-academic backgrounds, it probably is helpful to explain why the Diana Project was such a revolutionary uh, point in time and initiative. Um, so a few academics uh, at Babson and Harvard um, focused on uh, doing research on what we refer to as the equity gap. So equity capital is what is typically used um, to grow companies with. Um, so equity refers to either venture capital or it can refer to angel capital. And you asked for some statistics. So I'm going to start with uh, the latest data. In 2020, we actually saw a decline of funding to women-owned companies um, when we look at equity uh, for both the US and the UK. Um, in the US, only 2.3% of that funding 
went to women-owned companies. What's interesting is if you compare this to 2019, we had actually started to reach a high point of nearly 2.9% or nearly 3% of venture capital dollars that went to women on, uh, women only teams. What is interesting is for mixed gender teams, the figure was 10% at that time. We have this data from PitchBook and Crunchbase. These companies track data for investment and what I found interesting was I did a paper a few years ago with some colleagues, Susan Cole and Francis Samatucci, uh, where it emerged that for US data, women often told us that they had to be very pragmatic when pitching and that they often had to bring along a male uh, to secure a deal. So when you go to that pitch, some of the women told us um, in Susan's uh, words, you need to know when to bring the pants, <laughs> which I, I thought was both funny, but also highly illustrative of how pragmatic women uh, entrepreneurs were uh, to be able to land the deal, right? And so, here, I'm not even talking about data for the emerging economies. So I think the Diana team, uh, led by these amazing colleagues of ours, really opened a Pandora's box and revealed how the investment process really worked. Um, that act in itself was revolutionary. It unleashed a lot of research, all of us on this panel today, um, got involved in this particular area, partly because of the inequities that the Diana project revealed. However, the progress is mixed. But what I'm excited about is the fact that we now, of course, have big data to track this phenomenon. I know that uh, Haim is going to talk about his research. And what I think the Diana project enabled was they kicked off um, their research at a time, and we probably didn't know it at the time, but it coincided with uh, a move towards digital transformation, big data. And that has actually revealed for us that that early pitch stage is still the, the problematic stage. That's where we potentially see some bias creeping in. Um, and of course, what I'm excited about is that we can now bring transparency to fundraising and we can uh, use that transparency to make improvements for everybody. Well, that was an excellent response. Thank you, Ethne. I, the next question is for Haim Letwin, and that is, so how do women get money for their businesses in 2021 and going into 2022? Is there more funding available for women now? So this is a, just a wonderful question and kind of it fits so perfectly with, with the thing he was just talking about building off of that. So, you know, we know the news is kind of positive in that there has been a historic increase in regard to, to venture capital, except for this last last year. Um, we actually see the same thing with angel capital in that, you know, in 2004, only 3% of, of angel investment were women-led companies. Um, but there's been a, a significant increase. We've seen the, the low 20s percents as we get into the uh, teens uh, of this century and, and so on. So we're seeing an increase, but still this disproportionate representation where it, it still is uh, highly male teams that are getting getting funded. But what I'm particularly excited about that really fits into my research is um, kind of the new types of funding medium that are out there and how this might influence women's ability to get capital. So I specifically research crowdfunding and gender differences in crowdfunding. And the good news is that uh, compared to the traditional forms of capital, women have a much higher representation in crowdfunding. Still not equal representation, but much higher, about 35%. Uh, and potentially the even better news is that women are actually more likely to run a successful crowdfunding campaign 
than men. So I think this is a really fascinating question when we think about, well, why would this be? And there's a bunch of different reasons that have been kind of put out there and suggested and researched. One is this idea of activist choice homophily, which basically means that we have uh, funders, typically female funders, who disproportionately fund female entrepreneurs. And I think this happens in the angel world also, but we really see it happening in the, in the crowdfunding world. Beyond this, another very interesting thing, and you talked about biases a little bit, and we know historically these implicit biases, certainly at the very early stages, really seem to be uh, to negatively affect female entrepreneurs. But it actually may have the opposite effect in crowdfunding. We've done some research recently that suggested the biases that are held, so women are typically viewed, or at least the bias that people tend to hold regarding women as are being more communal and men being more algentic, and this seems to not be very beneficial in, crowd, in angel capital and venture capital, but in crowdfunding, where trust is just so unbelievably important, it actually appears to benefit women because people believe they're going to come through on the, on the product or the deal that they make with them. And there's not the same legal constraints that you have in an in a angel or venture capital situation. So I think in the end, the picture is still um, not great. Women are still disproportionately funded less than men. But some of these new mediums, I think, are opening up the opportunity for women to be more successful, especially at these extremely early stages where you often see crowdfunding happening even before the angel and the, angel and the venture capital. So, Ethne, do you have a comment to make on what Haim just spoke about? Yeah, you know, um, picking up on what Haim was saying, um, I think there's now some evidence that the more... Um, favorable conditions uh, for women to, to pitch and to obtain funding um, include actually um, not only crowdfunding, but um, funds that specifically actually don't include a pitch. Because that early stage where women have to pitch, um, inevitably, because of years of uh, inequality uh, in access to various forms of education and perhaps experience, lead them to, when compared to uh, male-owned companies, um, they really um, appear to, um, and partly because of who makes the decision on the other side of the table, right? Um, that women tend not to uh, perform so well. But there's a very interesting article in the Harvard Business Review this month, um, written by some academics uh, together with investors that have come up with alternative ways to evaluate uh, whether a company is worth investing in. And it doesn't include the pitch. Colette? Um, yes, just to add to that, there was a, a question, I think, earlier as to whether or not there are now more funds available for women entrepreneurs. And I think there, there possibly are. I mean, we're seeing a lot more <laughs> focus on the whole issue of access to finance. But I think one observation I would have is that, unfortunately, some of the very good funds and some of the very well-structured funds with the, the big money available are all targeted toward high growth high tech, perhaps export oriented businesses. And the right. problem is that that's not where women predominate. So it would be great to see more availability of, of funds outside of those areas. Yeah, so Haim, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. And actually, to, to, to add one thing to it that I found really interesting is while we've seen, you know, crowdfunding being this democratization of capital, if we look at the really, really high raises, um, they still tend to be more male dominated. And this is where we get into uh, these, these high tech type um, projects. And I think that probably relates to the biases that we are alluding to earlier. Well, and that is a wonderful segue into our next question for Barry Bendel. So women are seen as not as good at tech as men. And I don't think that's true because I'm better at tech than some of the men I work with. <laughs> um, I have a chemistry degree. So how do our actions being taken to 
dis- disavow this myth, I guess, is what I want to say. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, You're absolutely correct. These myths and stereotypes are patently false and incredibly damaging. Beyond watching our panel today, I encourage everyone who's watching um, to read Caroline Credo Perez's book, Invisible Women, for a much deeper discussion on the topic. First, I don't know if people truly understand how large and persistent the gender gap is in the launch of new science, technology, engineering, and math ventures, or in the STEM workforce more generally. Despite making up half of the U.S. workforce, women still vastly, are still vastly underrepresented in STEM fields. While women have made gains since 1970, women, <laughs> when they represented only 8% of the STEM workforce compared to 27% today, men clearly still dominate the field. STEM has traditionally played an important role in America's innovative and entrepreneurial capacity. And as everybody just noted, uh, is is a big um, attractor for large investors. To put this in perspective, seven of the 10 largest companies in the world were founded in the United States by men in STEM fields. Think about Apple, think about Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Facebook. The fact that so little progress has been made in 50 years is troubling, and it has become a self-perpetuating problem. So we have uh, where women don't join the field uh, or leave after experiencing bias or harassment or lack of opportunity, such that there are few women in STEM overall, and even fewer women entrepreneurs, leaders, and mentors. When looking in from the outside, women and men may seek Uh, may see a lack of women in the field and begin to doubt whether women have the skills or abilities to found a STEM venture or even work in the field, leading many women to choose not to enter STEM or exit early on, leaving few role models for the next generation and thus the cycle repeats. Yeah, that's a little depressing. (laughs) So, uh, has any progress been made? I guess you said a little bit, right? Yes, uh, and, and there are definitely actions being taken to overcome or at least mitigate this prejudice. So given how technical STEM is, graduate education and or work experience are often de facto prerequisites to founding a STEM venture. So the main action being taken is just to get more women into STEM fields and provide them the necessary support uh, once they're there. To that end, the good news is that a variety of nonprofit and government organizations have taken the STEM gender gap very seriously and are working to mitigate prejudice, build women and girls' interest in STEM, and offer support throughout their careers. For example, and some of these uh, are, are, are just kind of fun, uh, the Girl Scouts uh, have started offering STEM badges, including STEM career exploration and math and nature. Those did not exist when I was a, a Girl Scout back in the day. Uh, the nonprofit Girls Who Code reports providing in-person programming for nearly half a million girls, in addition to reaching another 500 million people with their online resources and advocacy. More aggressive public policies and funding at the local and global levels is occurring. Uh, Last month, the Department of Energy announced a new inclusive energy innovation prize for historically underrepresented communities with a focus on STEM and climate change. The UN continues to collect and publicize hard to capture data on gender inequality in STEM, uh, as well as encourage countries to address it through various programs. Given the overwhelming evidence that a variety of factors include discriminatory barriers, systemic bias, and socialization processes account for women's disproportionately low numbers of tech entrepreneurs and within the field overall. The onus cannot be on women alone to confront the gender bias. Well, that was an excellent summary. And I just have to say, girls thinking about going into STEM, it's going to be a lot easier today than when I did it. And also mothers of daughters going into STEM and women in STEM, there's hope. There's hope for the future. We just have to overwhelm them with our numbers, right, Barry? So so that moves us. Oh, yes, Ethne, did you have a question? So actually, um, I love the focus on STEM because we uh, definitely need to change the ratios there. But I actually want us to change that to STEAM because I teach a lot of students who become part of the creator community. 
And um, while I totally support what, what um, Barry's uh, analysis shows, I also think that we overlook some of the individuals who go on to start STEM-based companies, but the inspiration comes from an art mindset. So I'm going to give an example of a company that uh, I did research with in Germany. It's called Clue, uh, Hello Clue, and it's a, a cell phone based uh, app for tracking uh, fertility. And the woman who started that actually was inspired by her particular problem of not being able to become pregnant. Uh, and so together with uh, her team, her husband initially, and then others, she created um, an algorithm, put it on a phone, right? And was able to actually manage her own fertility. That app is one of the most downloaded for women across the world. And it came from a journalism major. <laughs> and, you know, I started an arts marketing platform because I see the potential in young people. There's so much digital uh, knowledge that goes into creating some of the applications that young people are excited about. And our job as educators is to show them the path to creating a successful company out of that. Absolutely. And that actually kind of segues into our next couple of questions. My next question is for Diane Welsh. And this is a really important one for us as women. Are women able to devote most of their time to their entrepreneurial pursuits, for instance, doing digital marketing or whatever? Or are they spending part of their time on childcare and other jobs? And how do we balance that out? Thank you, Elizabeth, for the question. And hello, audience. I'm a different entrepreneur in that I'm an academic entrepreneur and I've had a hotel, a restaurant and two consulting businesses. So I not only I sort of have my foot in both camps, the, the academic side, as well as the the um, business side of things. And I'd like to go back to the, a quote by Tip O'Neill, who was a famous politician in Boston, Massachusetts for many years and said, all politics is local politics. And if we apply that to translating the shift that we're talking about today, that it, all these changes really have to start at the local level. And so, you know, one of the things we've done here in my school is we got a, a grant from a national women's organization and we did um, years of programs with students starting in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade going into the STEM fields. And, you know, to really, and it was all on girls, girls going into STEM and, and especially in the technology area. And then bringing in role models of people that own their own businesses with that so they could actually experience it. So I think we've got to also look at changing the culture and how people think. And that's true around the world and, and um, you know, as much as I know that our experienced panelists have actually been around the world and I've been in 63 countries and it, obviously it, it varies from country to country, but the culture, the background, the history, the mores all play a role into this. And then having, as some of the panelists talked about competitions, um, bringing um, almost to a heroine mode or a hero mode of bringing up, you know, highlighting women that have been successful in business. This is extremely important. When we get into talking about the if issue of women, childcare, and jobs, no more in any time in our history has, has it been any more obvious than in the pandemic with COVID-19 around the world and how women have really taken the burden of this. And it is affecting us now. I just read a McKinsey report on the airplane on the way home from Lithuania, actually, a couple of days ago, um, that women are leaving the workforce in much higher numbers now. 
So the attrition rate's much higher. And this is, you know, basically six months out. Worldwide, we're at 42%. And um, much of that, you know, if you look, it's, it's going to vary country to country. It varies from industry to industry. But educators, for instance, which is usually much more stable in terms of them not leaving positions, they're leaving at a rate of 25% uh, worldwide. So it's much higher than we're, we're normally seeing, which is very, very low in the single digits. So what the, the issue is here is that, like it or not, they are taking the brunt of caring for the children. They're taking the brunt of educating children. They're taking the brunt of running the household, in some cases without any help, depending on, on the cultures and stuff worldwide, and not so much support in many cases. And so they're making it, they're feeling, um, and I've read many, many testimonials in this area, they're feeling that they have to make a choice. And this has always been the issue, I think, with women, is that we, uh, we have a tendency to feel responsible uh, for so much. And as uh, Dr. Lutwin brought up, that even on, this comes out even on um, social media and, and crowdfunding is that trust level is there because they will take on more, they will somehow manage. And um, so what we're seeing is they're, they're saying, well, I have to make a choice here between my kids and the job, and they're choosing their kids because they don't really see an, another out or another solution. Things will only change when we change the culture that when there's a work environment, that's, that there's got to be joint responsibility for what we're doing, and that that translates down to the local level, and that translates into childcare facilities, um, you know, even, you know, during the pandemic, um, many uh, vast majority of the workers that are, are nurses that are in healthcare are women. Mm -hmm. And it's not just nurses, it's, it's a lot of the lower paying jobs too, that, you know, in nursing homes and such. And what happened is that they were leaving the workforce at huge numbers because of the lack of support mechanisms. Our society has a, a responsibility to provide those support mechanisms for women. And women take the brunt of this. And it's not a, just a women's issue. It, it's a couple's issue. It's a responsibility issue that goes through the generations. Children are not born on their own. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, I agree that way, you know, yeah, I, I wanted to give Haim a chance to chime in right now, just briefly. You know, I, I find her comments to be so thoughtful. And, you know, one thing that really struck me of what you said was women have this expectation of themselves to take care. And I think it's even more than that. And I think it is one of the areas I really spend a lot of time studying are these implicit biases. And it is these implicit biases have led our young women, and then as they get older, to believe they have this responsibility, but also for everyone around them to have these expectations of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have, I'm just such a firm believer that we really need to attack these biases that we have about what men and women should be doing, because without that, I, I think it'll be a very, very hard problem to solve. And, you know, we need to have support from not just the women, women in the world, but the men in the world also to, to back them up and recognize that everybody needs to be involved in this. A hundred percent. I'd like to move the conversation on to Colette Henry now. Along the same line, has the shift to working at home helped women entrepreneurs or hurt them who are often juggling childcare with their other responsibilities? And what do you think is going to happen when people have to go back into the office when restrictions are lifted? Well, they're great questions and very topical just now. Um, I think to be fair, if we're being honest, when the pandemic first hit and we had our first lockdown, everybody probably thought, oh, this is brilliant. You know, we get to work from home and we get a bit of a break. And of course, everyone could benefit from that. So you didn't have to get into the car or to go to work or wait for your train or whatever it was. So the removal of having to go into an office or a place of work, I think was hugely beneficial, not just in terms of the, the time that was saved, and the cost, 
but also the the stress that went away when that extra travel time disappeared. So everybody was able to benefit. Um, I mean, it was cheaper working from home, let's face it. Um, you know, you had more time in your hands. It was just a lot more flexibility, which is lovely. But then I think that really changed very quickly. And it changed um, instantly when the schools closed. And that's when women got the biggest hit. Um, and as Diane has already said, when schools closed, women all of a sudden had to take on the responsibility, not just of childcare, but of um, educating their kids at home or at, at, at best supervising their screen time with, with their teachers when all the teaching um, was organized remotely. So this was just an added job for, for women and they got hit more than men. Um, I mean, the OECD, to give you an example, in 2020 estimated that women already did 10 times more caring than their male counterparts. So, I mean, that was incredible. And that was before the pandemic. So you can only imagine then how much that increased during the pandemic. So then you had women, you know, at home trying to work whilst homeschooling their children. Um, very possibly, as is the case for many women, they were also looking after a, an elderly parent or someone else who was ill. So you add all that into the mix and then there's absolutely no time left to do the job that you're actually paid for. So that created more stress indeed. And if you think about then women entrepreneurs, I think the impact there was very much dependent on the sector they were in. And we do know that women's sectors were hardest hit during the COVID pandemic. So any issue that we're discussing today in relation to women's entrepreneurship was absolutely exacerbated by the pandemic. Now, as for, I guess, um, you know, what will happen when the pandemic finishes? Um, we've already started to see as lockdowns lift, there is, I guess, a change in perception of what people should be doing. Um, I think there's less expectations from employers about having to be in the office every single day. But I would just be afraid that at some point things will return to sort of normal and employers will want to see their staff sitting in front of them at a desk, mm -hmm. regardless of what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's up to all of us to say, look, you know, we like a bit of flexibility. We need a bit of flexibility. We may not need to be in the office. Um, and I think we've got to push for that. But in the case of women entrepreneurs, it very much depends on the business sector they're in. I'd like to follow up on that. Thank you, Colette, some really great comments. And part of the issue goes back to where we started is we have less women in the STEM disciplines that pay better and much more women are in the service sector. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the lower paying positions and that require oftentimes require that face to face, the retail, the whatever it might be. And absolutely, employers need to hear very clearly include. And I think women employers are much more aware of this. And mm -hmm. there's been studies that have shown they're much more flexible even before the pandemic. But we have to have that flexibility in the workforce. And that's where this latest study came in that when companies are being really rigid and hard, people are leaving. And if even if they pay them more, because people, they're like, okay, we'll pay you more and you come back. They're seeing that as a transaction rather than a transformation of caring that they're making a difference in the workplace. And so they're leaving anyway. And so we've really got to look at the whole ecosystem of, women and how they operate around the world um, and how we've got to change it from the ground up and really make a difference. And, and you know, many of the people on this panel have, have made a huge difference in terms of how we think about that. But it also starts in colleges and universities and how we promote women to go into entrepreneurship. Um, when I started teaching, um, I was a single parent through my master's and doctorate <laughs> many years ago in the 80s. And I was the only woman at the University of Nebraska that was a single parent. And I had very supportive um, department chairs and deans and stuff that took me on and said, yes, please come. And that was great. But like, if we look at what's going on since then, 
you know, are we really promoting women in, in fields that make a difference? And entrepreneurship started out with a, is a very male field, and we're still seeing that, but it's gradually getting better. There are more women interested, but we have to keep recruiting them, change how women are looked at at the, at the home level, that they're given opportunities to try things, to start that first business when they're 10. That makes a huge difference. Thank you. Yes. And that brings us to actually our next question, which is, this this is another great segue. This is for Barry. So are the types of businesses that women are starting changing? So are they going more to online and social business? I mean, we used to sell Mary Kay, right? (laughs) Has that changed to more like influencers, YouTube, that kind of thing? Sure. Without a doubt, women are dominating the content production and influencer market space. Uh, Women can often charge up to four times more than their male counterparts for posts and endorsements on their social media platforms. While the top earning influencers can make millions uh, developing content, it's important to note that the role of influencer is often secondary for these individuals. Uh, So we're thinking about um, Selena Gomez or Zendaya or Ariana Grande, all of whom have millions uh, or even tens of millions of followers, primarily through their roles as musicians or actors. That said, there are lots of influencers making good money with only a fraction of these followers. Uh, Yet even among this group, it's gendered. Uh, One of the obvious explanations is that while women have had difficulties in the past securing funds for uh, for traditional ventures, as discussed by Professor Schwartz, um, outside of crowdfunding, as noted by Professor Letwin, um, the low startup costs in this digital space make entrepreneurship more accessible. So I think this kind of is a nice follow on uh, to to Diane's point. Uh, Another reason is that women are much more likely to use social media to start with. So one estimate suggests that on average, across all the major social platforms, 78% of women use social media versus 65% of men, and they do so for longer each day on average. Thus, the production and consumption aspects of social media are women dominated. Given reports that women are more likely to consult social media when shopping for new products, it makes sense that companies and brands would seek out women influencers to partner with. Lastly, consumers are increasingly looking for authenticity and personal connection when consuming goods and services. So again, I think this follows on naturally to our our crowdfunding and our sense of trust. Um, Some have suggested that women influences are particularly well positioned for this because they are more likely to share personal information and stories uh, online that help them connect with others. That's an excellent point. I've personally bought products off of social media. <laughs> so, um, I, I think you bring up a very good point. So Ethna, you had a comment. Yeah, you know, uh, just following up on that excellent um, overview of what's happening, translating the shift, which is the title for the segment, um, can also for me refer to translating into the 21st century economy. And it's digital. You know, entrepreneurship today is digital. I do research on Africa and I have material on what's happening with South African women uh, entrepreneurs. And um, outside of the influencer economy, what we are seeing is where women are well educated and they've had experience in the workplace. They In the case of South Africa, uh, I've seen women deliberately start ventures to solve social problems. They are highly motivated, partly because of the context. uh, And so I uh, am very encouraged that we are starting to see digital ventures in Africa raising very significant amounts of funding And, you know, recently um, there's uh, been a study that was um, published by the UN in conjunction with Jumia. So Jumia is the Nigerian equivalent of Amazon. And what they did was to actually look at the gender composition of the entrepreneurs, uh, small scale as well as larger. And the results are actually encouraging 
we do see all of the uh, patterns uh, that um, Professor Bandel uh, pulled out, you know, how women use the technology in very different ways. They often start with less, but they are so extremely skillful in exploiting those resources for now, success. I, I see a couple of hands up here. So uh, yeah. this is a hot topic. So Barry, you had your hand up first. What did you want to say? Sure. So, um, you know, I think to kind of, again, follow on regarding you know, whether or not it's easier, right, to jump into these realms. Uh, I do think it's easier as well. Uh, some people may chalk this up to the fact that social media influencing or content production is a relatively new career path, right? One that didn't <laughs> exist 10 years ago. But I think we have to keep in mind uh, that cryptocurrency, right, has been around for about the same number of years, and it's extremely male dominated. So where we only have 15 to 20 percent of crypto uh, traders are female. So this gender disparity in crypto matches or exceeds the gender gaps in the technology and financial sectors. So for example, women only hold 22% of leadership positions uh, in financial service firms. By contrast, social media content producers may have it easier in large part because many of the functional aspects of social media production and influencing are aligned with traditional marketing sector roles, where women increasingly own their own businesses and hold leadership positions. So indeed, women currently hold a slightly larger percentage of leadership positions in this industry. I think the last numbers I saw were around 55%. So I wonder if it is easier uh, for women because they can point to so many others in this space and ask, why not me? Uh, there may also be a sense of, well, if this person who doesn't have a business degree or previous experience can run a, a social media empire, may, maybe I can do that too. And so, you know, the rise of niche marketing strategies coupled with, uh, as you mentioned, uh, low financial barriers to entry, greater flexibility in time management, and of course, generally the ability to work from home, right? To work from almost anywhere, uh, make it appealing and seemingly less risky than other forms of entrepreneurship. Yes, that's an excellent observation. So, Diane, did you have a quick qu comment or question? Yeah, I was just going to make a comment that, based on what Ethne said, is it's very important around the world that we make sure our public policy is focusing on the infrastructure. Because, especially even in the United States and rural America, the lack of access to broadband mm -hmm. and the internet, if we go look at South Africa, one of the major issues they have is the cost of the internet and also the accessibility issue and um, really how good the, good the connectivity is. So around the world, that's, that's a huge issue. And um, the direct selling industry has really, you know, is in the billions and billions of dollars around the world is mostly dominated by women because they figured out they can do a lot of this online. Um, so, you know, but beyond that, I, I think that we really got to look at public policy issues mm -hmm. and realize what all the panelists said that women do dominate in this area. So we have to make sure they have the, the infrastructure to really work on it. And let's hope the infrastructure bill in the United States gets passed. My little <laughs> comment. Uh, I was just thinking probably that. has some more information on this from a public policy perspective, too. Yes, I was just thinking that there's this infrastructure bill, which does include broadband for many areas that need it. Um, excellent. So we need to move forward now. This was a great discussion on this question, but we're going to go to Heim now. And this follows up with what we've just been saying. Do you think this and other things have enabled women to start their entrepreneurship journey at a younger age? Are you seeing younger entrepreneurs? So, you know, this does really relate to what Professor Schwartz and Professor Mandel were talking about with the shift towards new technology. And you might expect that, in fact, you would have more younger entrepreneurs. And that, in fact, may be the case. But when you look at the overall average age of successful entrepreneurs, it's actually pretty surprising. We see that that sits around 40 to 45, which doesn't fit with kind of our typical view of, you know, the college dropout that goes and starts a big, a big tech business. Um, that being true, even beyond that, if we look at some of the statistics, we see that the percentage of young people starting businesses as a whole has decreased overall. So in 1996, we saw over a third 
of businesses were started by people between the ages of 20 and 34. And this is generally both men and women. But in 2018, that had declined to about 25 percent. So uh, as a whole, the percentages are shrinking, but that doesn't mean that more young people aren't starting businesses. It means that more older people are willing to start businesses. So I think, you know, maybe what we're seeing is this why not me is not just related to young men and women, but also to older men and women. Now, one thing, though, I think that we have to talk about when we talk about the age of entrepreneurs and particularly uh, female entrepreneurs is because female entrepreneurs do have an increased representation in a lot of these new industries like social media, uh, uh, being influencers and so on. And also they have an increased percentage in crowdfunding. These are both young people's games for lack of a better term, or at least we see that young people are more likely to be involved in these two areas. So my guess is uh, that we're seeing a slight increase in women compared to men for that. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount of good data out there. But as a whole, uh, young people are, are actually taking a smaller market share of starting businesses than older people. That surprises me. But that's great news for, for the rest of us, right? So I guess whatever age you are, you can start a business. I'm just wondering, I know this wasn't in our original questions, but how does the funding work out that way? Do the young people have a harder time getting funding? Is, do you think that's part of the reason there are more older people going? So, you know, I actually think when we think about that 40 to 45 year old, highly successful entrepreneurs, and, and to be clear, you know, it's important to recognize more young people may be getting funding, but we're also seeing these, these older people um, getting funding also. But when we think about that 40 to 45 year old group that's really starting the successful business, it, it's probably because they have taken some shots, they've increased their network, they've had an opportunity to fail and learn, and we know how important failure is. So then uh, those people are able to, to get more funding and to be more successful um, simply because of their experience that they've already had. And, and by the way, we talk about implicit biases. There are also biases about younger people starting businesses and how comfortable people are to invest in younger, uh, very young people, college students particularly. Not that they can't be extraordinarily successful, as we know, um, but a as a whole, somebody a few years out, 10, 20 years out, it, it can can have the opportunity to get a little more funding. Yes, I see Diane has a quick comment. If we go back to the research of uh, Holly Butner and Dot Moore uh, on women entrepreneurs that's been done through qualitative research with interviews, what we learned from that early research is that, um, and I'm trying to remember exactly when that came out, but it was like in I want to it was 2003, 2000, yeah. early 2000s, their books, yeah. they a couple of them that, you know, what we know is that women usually try things first before they start their own business and they have more responsibilities earlier in their life. And so that makes more, more women start businesses at a little bit later age than males. And I well, think that probably still holds true. Um, and so women, what we know with women entrepreneurs is they usually try to get experience of what they're doing first. And so that makes, makes a big difference too. I think I just want to add that. In. I, I think that's really true. Uh, that kind of takes us into our next question for Colette, which is what have been the most significant changes that have taken place in the realm of women's entrepreneurship from, from a research and a policy perspective over the last two decades? Well, that's a great question for this panel, I think, because we're all involved in research. Um, and I think the first thing that we'd probably say is that, um, you know, there's been a considerable growth in, in just the, the volume of um, research on women's entrepreneurship in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, certainly since the first couple of papers uh, emerged by people like Schwartz and, and Crummy in the 70s and 80s. Um, so, so what we're seeing now is, you know, many more conference papers, journal articles and books, symposiums dedicated to women's entrepreneurship around the world. Um, now, as you know, I edit a journal, the International Journal of Gender and Entrepreneurship, and we focus on women's entrepreneurship. And we've seen a considerable increase in the volume of submissions in the last even five years. Um, it, certainly the volume of submissions from around the world. So we're seeing a lot more research coming forward in the underdeveloped countries 
whereas typically five or six years ago, all the research would have been centered on the Western economies. So that's a really good thing that we're getting a sort of a wider view of women's entrepreneurship. So something we find in the journal is that the format of the special issue, which all journals use, is a great vehicle for attracting research from leading scholars on what are the hot topics of the day. And um, in the last few years, um, certainly in our journal, some of the hot topics in research have been things like family embeddedness, um, the many identities of a woman entrepreneur, not just entrepreneur, but mother, caregiver, all of these things. Um, context and networking have been really hot topics uh, more recently. And I think another big change that we've seen in recent years has been the increase in the number of organizations and symposiums that have been dedicated to women's entrepreneurship. And you mentioned at the beginning, Elizabeth, that this panel was very much inspired by the Diana, Diana International Research Institute. And of course, they've done huge work. Um, and then we've seen you know, conferences like USASB and ICSB have their own dedicated tracks and dedicated groups working on women's entrepreneurship scholarship. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, um, I'm involved in the Global WEP group. That's a group of scholars looking at women's entrepreneurship policy. And we recently published a report with the OECD. And the good thing about that and all of that other work that I mentioned by scholars around the world is that it's constantly bringing to the attention of people who can make a difference what the top hot topics are, what those key items are that need attention and need policy intervention. So I think the single biggest thing that all researchers and all advocates of women's entrepreneurship ha have done in recent years is just to keep bringing that debate forward and get it to the attention of policymakers. That is an excellent observation. And that's really what it takes, the decision makers. That's what we call them in marketing, right? Getting to the decision maker. And policy drives that and research drives policy. So that is really, really an astute observation. Are there any comments on what Colette has just spoken about? Um, actually, Colette, um, I would like to just pick up on <clears throat> one very important trend that we are seeing Globally, uh, the debate in England currently has actually even reached Parliament uh, in the last week or so, uh, with uh, debates going on uh, within the Labour Party uh, in the UK. And it's around how we look at gender and gender identity. Um, are you seeing um, based on the policy work that you've done and published with OECD, um, how that sort of filters across different uh, domains, uh, as well as different countries, perhaps. Well, I think what we've seen from the Global WEP report with the OECD um, is that entrepreneurship is different in every country and how governments um, support it is different. But a couple of interesting things came out of our report. And one was that um, we find lots of countries where there was uh, women's entrepreneurship programs on the ground, but there was no formal women's entrepreneurship policy. And I think that's something that governments are really looking at now and realizing that you know, you can't just do women's entrepreneurship on a Monday and then, you know, forget about it by the weekend. In order for it to be <laughs> consistent, you've got to have an overarching policy. And the good thing about that is that any good programs that just happen to be there um, will get the, the sustainability that they need. If it's embedded in policy, it's going to happen. So that's a big change we find. That's yeah. excellent. So my next question flows from this as well. It's for Diane. What are some of the local implications and implementations from all of these policies that can help to catalyze younger individuals to take action? Excuse me. <laughs> that was a sneeze well planned, I guess. <laughs> okay. Do you want to clap? Clap. clap. Okay, I'm ready to answer a question. <laughs> um, 
Well, I think that from the local level, yes, absolutely. If we, I've been working with women in Pakistan uh, with a the, one of the centers there that are trying, they call the program Mom Entrepreneurs, and um, it, it's sort of culturally based in their religion, but that women can be entrepreneurs and how can they do, do things in, in different ways. But when we go back to what Colette said, I think it's very obvious that we have to uh, advocate at the local level and in all spec sectors for policy changes and that that change has to be local. It has to be constant, as, as Colette said, and just things that, you know, from my research around the world is basic child care facilities, elder care facilities, support systems, um, tax systems that give credit for these kinds of things that if they if they are done at home, you know, how are you going to implement a tax system that helps women that are trying to to start their business and um, have other responsibilities, the education system, um, all the things that traditionally women have fallen to women, we need to look at those. And um, it, it's in so many situations, as Colette said, it's sort of not the rah rah. Look at what we're doing for women, and we're having a networking, you know, system or women's network at the at the local level. That's all great. That's all fine. But it's really got to take place through the government into higher levels. So, um, Representative, uh, she's a Congresswoman. Uh, Kathy Manning, who's recent, this is the first time she's been elected here in North Carolina. And she was really advocating for um, the, the, the issues with uh, physical harm to women in the military system be heard outside the military system and outside of military courts. And finally, that has gotten through in the United States and was re just recently passed. So it, it goes to to outside the military system for those cases to be heard because the military wasn't able to do that within their system. So these kinds of things um, in terms of um, dangers to women, to physical violence to women, all those issues we really have to look at around the world and continue our policy um, to advocate for, to hear those voices heard. Lots of times the people, um, that we have to advocate for will not have as the voice we all have on the screen. And That's, so we have to remember that yeah. and continue to participate and, and um, speak up. Thank you. Yes. So Haim has a comment. Yeah. So, I mean, um, building on what Professor Henry and Professor Wells said, you know, I think when we talk about policies around female entrepreneurs, we really focus on policies specifically affecting women. But I think another thing to think about is other policy shifts regarding industries have opened up opportunities for women. So both the Jobs Act, which wasn't passed that long ago, that allowed crowdfunding, I think was very beneficial towards women. And the legalization of marijuana, if we look at the cannabis industry, women disproportionately own uh, um cannabis companies. And I think what it is, is these new industries where there aren't the same preconceived notions of who runs these businesses are, are opening up opportunities for women to, to run new businesses in new industries. That's, that's great, <laughs> really. So I have one last person specific question for Ethne, and then we will have a little bit of time for some general discussion. But Colette, did you have a comment to make on this? Um, yes, just a very quick one there. Um, again, it's just reinforcing the need for uh, support for women's entrepreneurship to be embedded in, in a government's policy. And one really interesting thing that came out of our 27 country report with the OECD was um, coming from Australia. And they found that uh, the majority of the really good initiatives for women entrepreneurs were not funded by the government at all. They were just funded, as Diane had mentioned, by you know local funders or the corporate sector. So I think that sort of um, just reinforces the need for governments to get involved. Absolutely. And that takes us to our last uh, person-specific question for Ethne, and then we'll have a little bit of time for general discussion. So Ethne, 
we can't speak about women entrepreneurs today in fall of 2021 without acknowledging the plight of women in Afghanistan. And I wonder if you could speak about the challenge that the new reign of the Taliban will pose to women in the MENA region and, and please define the MENA region for us. Thanks, Elizabeth. So the MENA region is the Middle East and North Africa. And, you know, I can't really point to the map, but we all know that my head is kind of sitting adjacent to that. Um, and the reason we wanted the map there is that entrepreneurship is a global uh, phenomenon. Um, and so I want to start by just making some general comments and then I'll go into Afghanistan specifically. So when institutions change, really what we typically see is that the most vulnerable in society either benefit the most or suffer uh, the consequences uh, of whatever change is unleashed. So here I'd like to include examples from say the US when we look at the abolition of slavery and the freedoms that came from that um, and what that meant for African-Americans to go on and own property. So property rights become established, right? And they can enter workplaces previously shut to them. Now, of course, this change was uh, not uh, unproblematic as we know from American history, but it, it gives us kind of an, a sense of uh, how progress is. You sometimes make a little bit of progress and then go back, but it, it's a process that is iterative. So it's imperative that the oppressed actually participate in the solutions when countries are modernizing. So when I look at um, uh, the Taliban coming back into power, what I um, am concerned about is, um, you know, what does this mean for women? So in the US and also in my native South Africa, we see that women actually participated very actively in shaping the solutions that helped to allow them to become entrepreneurs, often becoming involved politically and legally. So in South Africa, um, a very progressive and inclusive constitution was crafted because women were involved politically and insisted on being at the table when the negotiations uh, occurred to end the apartheid regime. I shuddered to think what would have happened had that not been the case. Women would have been excluded, I'm sure, from, uh, for example, holding the kind of property rights that they do in South Africa today. And so what we are learning about Afghanistan is that the Taliban, um, essentially they fear women right? They fear women having power and self-determination over their lives. Um, and we can see this because they don't want women to be educated or to work in jobs other than the very basic healthcare jobs where there is great need and they have no choice, right? But to allow those people to go into hospitals or other care facilities. What I've been seeing as I follow the news is that, um, ironically, they allow girls to attend primary or elementary school, but not high school. So theoretically, you can go to university if you're female, but how can you go from elementary school to university if you're not allowed to go to high school? I mean, it's just nonsensical. However, um, what we are seeing also is that, you know, the population there is not the same population that they governed in the 1990s, the early 1990s. So we are starting to see people asking for the West uh, and not only the West, but countries um, supportive of women's rights to uh, support resistance against these policies. Um, so in the 1990s, we know that the Taliban actually prevented women from working during the five years they were in power. 
Um, and so education, you know, is revered by Islam. Women are not, um, according to Islam, prevented from work or education, etc. And so during that early 1990s period, I don't know if any of you remember, but some young girls at an elementary school actually went on a hunger strike to be allowed to go to school. And, you know, it tears at my heart that geopolitically, um, the change that we've seen in the institution of government in Afghanistan has the potential to affect the entire North African region, as well as parts of Asia, right? If you think about where Afghanistan is, it actually shares a very, very extensive border with Pakistan. And the Pakistani government, led by Imran Khan, um, has actually expressed support for the Taliban. So what this portends, we don't know yet. But I would anticipate that we'll start to see a more conservative wave washing over that region. That is not great news. <laughs> um, I don't know what the world can do about it. I think conservatism, conservative, conservatism is washing across a lot of the world. And it'll be interesting to see how that does affect women, uh, women's rights here in the United States even. And I don't know what the solution is. Maybe we can, for the last question, it'll be a general question. Everybody on the panel could take a minute to say, answer the question, have we truly made progress? What more can we do? Uh, I know a minute's not a long time, but just where do we go from here? So Ethne, would you like to start? Well, I'll actually pick up on what can we do to support women in Afghanistan. And we all teach at universities where we have students who come from all over the world. Um, I personally teach students who come from Afghanistan. And what I'd like to see is universities actually doing something. University leadership uh, should help to establish funds for women from Afghanistan to come and study in the US and cre help create options uh, for them. So I do think, you know, overall, uh, of course, I, I think we're seeing a trend uh, worldwide that is, you know, positive. But um, when we go into these, um, processes of change that take us back. Um, I think we as educators, as researchers, it behooves us to be the spokespeople to say, you know, this is not okay. I agree. Haim, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I would say, yes, we have definitely made progress, but not nearly, nearly enough. Um, Where's the most significant progress occurred? I think it's probably in some of the policies that have been implemented, as well as some of the uh, new ways in which women can get involved in entrepreneurship. Uh, but I still think there are tremendous barriers. And I think the, the biggest barrier is in fact, these general biases uh, against, or at least general biases related to how women are viewed. And until we are able to fundamentally change that at a societal level, I think these barriers will always continue to exist. So I think we all need to be allies and push hard to try to uh, focus on changing these preconceived notions and biases around what women and men can do. I agree. Diane? Well, I, I sort of take it in it to the action level. And so I, I've done three or four seminars with this mom entrepreneurs program in Pakistan. Because I think hearing from someone else outside their country helps. And I try to work with them individually. And I, I hear about all the barriers they have, even in the home front, where, you know, the male, male if, if it's not their husband, their the father-in-law can decide different things where they don't have a voice. So we talk about things like that. So I've sort of done it action oriented. And then I just came back from Lithuania where I taught about 30 students to do business models. And that country has been out of 
um, left the Soviet Union roughly about 30 years ago and is free. So I think that we have a responsibility to go in and volunteer and do these things on the ground, which is pretty exhausting. <laughs> it was quite a trip to get back, but like 28 <laughs> hours or something like that by the time I got back. But um, to really, you know, I took them down to the chamber and they presented in front of the chamber and they were in professional clothes and they had a professional room. It wasn't in the, in, in the university to, to really, you know, okay, what can we do in two weeks and can we do a business model and how does entrepreneurship work? Because of the history of communism, they they don't have the families, you know, the parents and the grandparents that had businesses and we learned so much from modeling. So I think more of an action approach. I like mm -hmm. uh, Ethany's uh, idea about starting a fund because the major university in Afghanistan has closed to women, to women now. Mm -hmm. Budding. So if we had a fund to help and maybe some of the organizations like the gender uh, division of the Academy of Management, you say, yes. you're excellent. Right. Yeah. So, so that, and that's, we start putting a fund together to help with this because, you know, uh, petitions really aren't enough. It's going to take the funding. That's great. That's great. I'm sorry, Diane. Um, it was supposed to be one minute each. So sorry. But the we problem is you have a bunch of academics on this, so that's never worked. <laughs> I know. So um, so Colette, what are your final thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, I agree with Heim that we've come a long way, but there is still an awful lot more to do. And I think um a couple of key points for the future that I think um, we need to take on board. I think there needs to be more monitoring and evaluation of programs and policies, because at this stage, you know, we're not in a position to highlight the things that really do work and share those with other countries, or indeed highlight the things that don't work and need to be changed. Mm. And we need to make sure that everything to do with women's entrepreneurship support is connected to the wider ecosystem. Because as Diane mentioned in Pakistan, there's no point in coming out with um, a good policy only to find that because of the traditions and cultures, um, you know, it's, it's not going to work. And then maybe finally, um, make sure that we start to focus support on those sectors where women actually do predominate. There's a novelty <laughs> as opposed to the sectors where they don't predominate. I think that would make a huge difference. That's excellent advice. And Barry. Sure. I, I mean, I've already said such great things. It's hard to add something uh, meaningful, but I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think tackling the socialization of women is, is a huge issue. Both, again, both genders need to, to look at this and figure out um, ways to, to help reduce those preconceived notions, um, you know, again, back to the uh, responsibility for housework and caregiving. Uh, I think McKinsey just had a report that said um, uh, mothers are three times more likely than fathers to be responsible for housework and caregiving. And so that's a problem, you know, that, that doesn't make it easy uh, for entrepreneurship. But tying it back to social media, I think by having, and, and to, to uh, the, the previous responses, I think uh, having that visibility in social media, there are so many women that are um, taking on these very public and active roles uh, that I think, uh, again, women may get more inspired than previously. Uh, and I think that's that's showing up in uh, the, at least the United States, with the number of increase in um, applications for new business starts. Uh, women have led the, the growth in that area. Very well said. And this has been an excellent panel discussion. Thank you all. I want to remind our listeners who is on the panel. Ethne Swartz is Professor of Management at the Feliciana School of Business and Coordinator of Entrepreneurship Co Concentration in the Department of Management in, at Montclair University in New Jersey. Haim Letwin is the Academic and Center Director of Entrepreneurship at Suffolk University in Massachusetts. Diane Welsh is the Hayes Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship and Founding Director of the Entrepreneurship Programs at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Colette Henry is head of Department of Business Studies at Dundek Institute of Technology, Ireland, and adjunct professor at Griffith University, Australia. And Barry Bendell is an associate professor of entrepreneurship at Suffolk University in Massachusetts. And you can find all of our presenters here today on LinkedIn. And if you want to find this on YouTube, just type in Women Entrepreneur Week Montclair, and this will be on YouTube. So this has been an excellent discussion. Thank you, Montclair. Thank you, Women's Week. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.
Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me.